hey, you remember when I said at the end of that Owl House video that I was gonna watch Amphibia at some point too? There's a couple of shows, shows there right, right now that I need to watch myself, myself. Like, like Amphibia, Amphibia on, on Disney Channel. Well, I have. It's also great. And here's why. Amphibia is an animated TV show on Disney Channel created by Matt Brawley, who had previously worked as a storyboard artist for movies like Turbo and for other animated shows like Steven Universe and Big City Greens. Oh yeah, and he was also a storyboard artist and episode director for that one popular show on Disney Channel whose name escapes me. The show centers on Anne Boonchoy, a 13-year-old girl who finds herself stranded in a world of anthropomorphic amphibians. She soon stumbles into the town of Wartwood and meets a family of frogs named the Planters, including Hopadia or Hop Pop, the geriatric patriarch, Polly the rambunctious Pollywog, and Sprig, the adventurous young frog whom Anne forms a fast friendship with. Season 1 focuses on Anne's slow indoctrination to the world of Amphibia, and earning the residents of Wartwood's trust, as we learn slowly but surely how she came to be in this strange new world, and what has become of her two friends who were also transported here. The show was officially greenlit along with The Owl House on February 19th, 2018, and premiered June 17th the following year. And while The Owl House was on my radar ever since it was first announced, I'll admit that, for some reason or another, I didn't start watching Amphibia until a few months after it had begun its second season. I'd seen enough clips and behind-the-scene videos that I knew this was probably a show that I would enjoy, but didn't actually take the leap. What, it's about frogs, you gotta have at least one. Until Owl House had finished its first season. I'm not entirely sure what I expected from the various clips and word of mouth I'd seen over the internet. But what I found was an increasingly hilarious slow burn that took many familiar conceptions with the kid from another world genre, which I'm being told the cool kids call the isekai genre, gotta hope I said that right, and added its own amphibian flair to it. I knew pretty early on while I was watching the first season that I wanted to make a sort of follow-up to my Owl House video, in case there were any people like me who may have slept on Amphibia in favor of its sister show, but wanted to wait until season 2 was over to form a more complete opinion. Or two-thirds of a complete opinion, anyway. Lo and behold, season 2 has come and gone, and there's, uh... <laughs> there's a lot, quite a lot, to discuss. Let's begin. Hey, wait a minute, isn't this how I started the Owl House video? There's a common complaint I see a lot from fellow adults who watch shows primarily targeted at children, that some of the episodes, characters, and plot lines all feel... samey. Even ignoring the whole isekai genre, and the familiar plot conventions that come from a lost child in another world, there are a number of episodes in Amphibia that will probably call to mind similar episodes and morals from other shows. Like how Anne and or Sprig and or Polly will be faced with some form of dilemma that they think they can solve their own way, but end up having to eat crow when they're proven wrong later. Such as when Anne thinks she can drive the planter family snail, Bessie, without reading the manual first. Or when Sprig becomes obsessed with the idea that someone in town doesn't like him. Or when Sprig thinks he can take over the farm from Hop Pop, and challenges him to a duel, a la that one episode from Dinosaurs. If you harm one scale on that boy's head, so help me, I'll... I'll disconnect your premium cable channel! You'd make me watch basic? The familiarity of the characters themselves can also be a turnoff to those who find Anne, Sprig, or anyone else too similar to other animated protagonists and supporting characters from other TV shows. There's a certain level of unspoken influence that's shared among the popular contemporary shows, and just what the creators themselves grew up with. Matt Brawley has stated that some of his inspiration for the show's characters and setting came from the works of Studio Ghibli, citing many of the famous female protagonists in Miyazaki's movies as influence for Anne, as well as fantasy stories like The Lord of the Rings and The Dark Crystal for the setting of Amphibia, on top of a deep well of anime influence. Many other showrunners cite a lot of these sources as their own inspiration, so it's easy to see how characters or character tropes can bleed into several shows, intentionally or not. Whether or not this is a bad thing ultimately depends on how much you like the characters or the show itself. I think those who have been following me since the Owl House video have probably figured out that I'm relatively easy to please. I wouldn't say I blindly like everything I watch, but if a show or movie hits me in the right ways, I find it easy to look past how many times I've seen a moral or episode done before. 
I don't mind as much that something like body swapping or shrinking plots in the Owl House were already done before in Gravity Falls, because they still manage to do fun things with the setting and characters that is distinct to the Owl House. And the same is very much true for Amphibia. The first episode in particular, I feel, handled the introduction to Anne and the Planters in a fairly unique way. Starting us out at Wartwood, and being introduced to the human character through the more outlandish Frog Kid. My roommate was a Frog Kid. You ever see a Frog Kid? The more conventional way to open a series like this would involve showing how Anne and her friends came to be in Amphibia. Something that is only vaguely seen in the series intro, and at the end of the first segment of the first episode but isn't elaborated further until the end of Season 1. And while the rest of Season 1 is a very slow burn, there's enough little nuggets of mystery sprinkled throughout that it never feels like the show is aimless. If we're not learning something about the greater mystery of the box that brought them here, then we're learning a little bit about the characters themselves, often through the many misadventures they find. This brings us to the characters themselves. Guys, 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 I just had the craziest dream I was trapped in a world of frog pee. Oh. Right. Season 1's slower pacing and slice-of-life approach means that we get ample time to familiarize ourselves with the small town of Fortwood and the intersocial relationships therein. The planters are far from the most important citizens in Frog Valley when we meet them, but we get the sense that their family has been an integral part of the community for a considerably long time. Hot Pop will take any excuse to bring up the old ways and try to educate his grandkids on family and local tradition even when they couldn't care less. This typical generational divide is somewhat exacerbated when Anne is taken in by them. It's not that she's ungrateful for Hop Pop sticking his neck, figuratively, out for her when everyone else in town thought she was a monster, but 13-year-olds aren't exactly known for their humbleness. Well, if I'm the princess, then you're the king of bad cooking. <laughs> oh! This clash of generational ideologies isn't done to dunk on the olds, nor are Anne's overall teenageisms used to try to appeal to kids in an overtly cynical sense. How do you do, fellow kids? What? Throughout season one, the kids in Hop Pop learn from each other in ways that surprise all of them. Anne may initially find the idea of reading a manual filled with seemingly nonsensical anecdotes of Bessie's past boring as sin. Are there pictures? There are diagrams! No! Dramatic much? But she finds herself fascinated by these stories later on, and sees their use in treating Bessie not as just a mode of transportation, but as a noble and beautiful creature who will do or die for her rider and her family. <laughs> You go, girl! Hop Pop, meanwhile, is quick to brush off many new things Anne tries to introduce them to. What is this demonic nonsense? But finds himself wrapped up in many of the shenanigans he claims to hate. But you hated Suspicion Island! Hated it? Hated it? I loved it! But the clash of ideologies isn't just restrained to Hop Pop versus Anne. While she and Sprig get on relatively fast, Anne's attempts to bond with Polly by doing more stereotypically feminine activities, like getting a makeover or spa treatment, only end up alienating the more tomboyish Polly, who would rather spend the day perfecting her spit distance. It's not that the show enforces a strict gender binary. Girl thing! Gender is binary! Anne is perfectly content to get down and dirty on many of their adventures. But being a teenage girl, she's still drawn to more conventional teenage girl things, like magazines and shopping sprees. But she also comes to learn that Polly's interests are what make her, her. And trying to impose her own ideas on what girl time is, and calling Polly a slob for what she loves isn't right. You saying you were wrong? Very wrong. Super wrong? Super wrong! You're always wrong! I'm always- hey! A lot of Anne's time in Wartwood revolves around challenging her preconceived notions on self-image, and what it means to be a good friend. In the second segment of the first episode, she and Sprig decide to sneak out of the house when Hop Pop tells them it's better for her to lay low for a while, so the town can acclimate to her better. Sprig is reluctant to go against Hop Pop's orders, and even more reluctant to swim in the lake when he sees a hastily written warning sign. But Anne's notions of true friendship seem... pretty clouded. Look, if a friend likes a pencil case, you get it for them. If your friend likes your new shoes, you give them to her. 
And if a friend wants you to steal a crazy music box from a thrift store, even if you really don't want to, you do it, okay? Because if you don't, they might not want to be your friend anymore. Before Anne came around, Sprig admits he didn't really get on with many of the other kids. All except for his childhood friend Ivy, who is just as energetic as he is. But even then, speaking from experience, it can be pretty lonely when even just one person clicks with you. No matter how great a friend you may have, you kind of wish there were more like you two after a while. This makes Sprig especially adamant to try and get into Anne's good graces. And what leads them both into trouble when the Midgar Zolom attacks them. I don't know if this snake is a specific reference to the Midgar Zolom, but that's what I choose to believe. As the season goes on, and we learn a little more about Anne's relationship with her friends, we start to see a clear difference between the way the planters, especially Sprig, treat her, and the way she was treated back in her world by her friends. Namely this one, Sasha Waybright who is such a piece of work that I knew I'd have to dedicate a whole section of this video to her, in sort of the same way I had to dedicate an entire section to just Amity Blight in the Owl House vid. So what makes Sasha so special, you ask? Well, I'm not talking about her yet, moving on. I keep mentioning that season 1 of Amphibia is fairly slow in its approach to the greater mystery as to why Anne and her friends ended up here in the first place. And this is where a lot of people may find themselves losing interest depending on what exactly they're looking for. If you're looking for more focus on said mystery aspect, and on the deeper lore of the world itself, then you're not gonna get that until season 2. And even then, there's still a few Adventure of the Day episodes before the plot really gets moving. Sasha herself isn't properly introduced until episode 10, where she gets an entire segment dedicated to herself in the ominous and foreboding Toad Tower. Anne's other friend, Marcy Wu, isn't even introduced until near the halfway point of season 2. Something Matt Borelli has commented was a pretty risky move if they weren't eventually picked up for two more seasons. It's not exactly uncommon for the first season of Amphibia to be so slow in its setup, though. A lot of shows that feature overarching plots and myth arcs will most likely have first seasons that consist of self-contained stories and moral of the week lessons. This happened in The Owl House, Gravity Falls, and even as far back as Avatar The Last Airbender. I think a lot of people tend to forget how season 1 of Avatar especially was much more adventure oriented than focusing specifically on Aang's quest to stop the Fire Lord. And any show that deviates from the specific season or overall plot can get accused of having too much filler. If I had to compare the structure of Amphibia Season 1 with another show's though, I'd probably compare it to Steven Universe. Oh, wait, no, can't do that. The internet says I'm supposed to hate that show now. Um, I would compare it to Sally Galaxy, the show where a half-human Brick Hybrid goes on many magical adventures with her Brick Guardians. Just as many, if not more, episodes of Season 1 focused on the regular human characters of the town Sally lives in, however. And by the time things were really starting to heat up with the di er, Marble Authority, people started to get sick and tired of all the episodes dedicated to the human side of things. I understand that to an extent, especially when the show's infamous hiatuses meant that you often had to wait months between episodes that move the plot forward. And I've seen Amphibia get sort of the same complaints here and there. It's not nearly as bad considering there's only two seasons right now. But there are those who lament the show deciding to split the focus between the quest of getting Anne back home, and more slice of life style episodes. Especially when the show is on an 11 minute time frame, save for a few special 22 minute episodes here and there. I'd be lying if I said I thought every episode was needed per se. But even in the most seemingly inconsequential of filler episodes, there's more likely than not an important character moment that marks a shift in that character's arc for the rest of the season or show. In one of the later episodes of season 2, where the bulk of the episode is focused on the antics of Bessie and the newer baby snail, Micro Angelo, Matt Brawley pointed out on his Twitter that Anne had an important moment of self-reflection that many who tend to skip the filler episodes would miss out on, and I'm inclined to agree with him. Even in the most fillery of filler episodes, there's more often than not some great moment of character building that you might not get from an episode that's more focused on building the plot or the lore. Like even in The Great Divide, often considered the most inconsequential or downright worst episode of Avatar, there's a great moment where Aang is overlooking the two feuding tribes and commenting to himself how nice it would be to sit at one of those campfires. 
to belong with an ordinary tribe of people. It's lonely, isn't it? Being impartial. It's a small moment, one you don't necessarily have to see to understand Aang's arc throughout the show. But it reinforces it, I think. Strengthens it. And the same is true for a lot of episodes in Amphibia. I mean, you could skip episodes like the one where Anne feels left out when the planters want to go camping without her. Or the one where Anne gets sits all over her face and becomes super popular in town because of them. But you'd miss the first clue as to what the music box that brought Anne and her friends to Amphibia really is. Or wonderfully affirming moments where the planters all but state that Anne is part of their family now. Don't have to be blood to be a planter, Anne. I guess to a frog, blood isn't that much thicker than water. Actually, at 3508, you use blood is thicker than water, but you used it incorrectly. The saying in that four is taken out of context. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. Full saying. Blood is thicker than water actually is the blood from the covenant is thicker than the water from the womb. And I know this for Tumblr reasons. Well, actually, there's a longer version that says the blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb, which, on top of sounding like a tagline for Bloodborne 2, was most likely originated to explain this blah, the to explain was most likely originated to Blood is thicker than water. The fun fact, where most people use this phrase to mean blood family is more important than friends or found families, it is actually meant to mean opposite. The full phrase is the blood of bottle is thicker than Blood the is thicker than water, but honey is thicker than blood. Conclusion, praise the bees. Blood is thicker than water, but syrup is thicker than blood. So... Blood of the Covenant is thicker than the water of the womb is a useful thing to know the full quote of. Yep. I knew that. All this is to say that it's fine if the more Slice of Life episodes don't strike your fancy. But there's still some important character bits, even in the filler episodes. And it's impressive for any show to hide actual character progression in seemingly unimportant misadventures. I would also argue that having an entire season built around Anne, the Planters, and the residents of Wartwood helps to endear us to all of them and make us legitimately care when genuine danger comes their way. And with that in mind, now let's talk about Sasha. I may have given off the wrong impression before when I said that Sasha is a real piece of work. I don't dislike her to any extreme extent. I find her quite fascinating, actually. She's the kind of character that has so many layers to her actions and thought process that it's hard to tell when she's being genuine or when she's putting up a front. Or, in an even more confusing way, whether she thinks she's being genuine or is just deluding herself. From the way Anne talks about her to Sprig, even indirectly, we can tell there's a lot of emotional baggage to unpack. And when we finally get a segment dedicated to her as a prisoner at Toad Tower, a place where all the hardened criminals of the valley surrounding Wartwood are taken, we can see the shades of the person Anne sounded intimidated by. She's genial enough to the Toad Guards who are looking over her, but she seems to be doing it more out of trying to annoy the captain of the guard, Grime, than anything else. And even when she tells Grime to encourage his troops in order to whip them into shape, she phrases it in the most brutal way possible. If you keep yelling at them like that, they'll keep being useless, and we'll all die. In the final episode of Season 1, we get an extended flashback of the day Anne and the others found the music box, which just so happened to be her birthday. Oh, well happy birthday. Give me that! Sasha decides that they should ditch school and go have fun, completely disregarding Anne's reluctance and eventually disregarding her desire to go back home to her birthday party. Come on, hang out with your friends that love you. Sasha, I really like to, but- Anne, this isn't cute anymore. We are meeting up with Marcy right now. End of discussion. Sasha is very much the type of person who operates under the catch more flies with honey than vinegar philosophy. Actually, you catch the most flies It's just an manure. expression, a fancy way of saying you're more likely to get what you want by acting in a sweet way than in a distasteful way, like vinegar. But when she isn't getting what she wants through simple sweet talk, her more assertive side kicks in. This gives her all the trappings of your typical bully, mean girl character. But it's not entirely as simple as that. Much later into the show, we see the first meeting between the three girls, and how Sasha stood up to two teenagers who were picking on Anne and Marcy, showing that even when she was clearly outmatched, she cared enough for two random strangers that she stood up for them. 
We see her stand up for Anne in the beginning of the flashback in the season 1 finale too, using her status as the cool girl to help her friends. Matt Brawley has stated that the point of Sasha wasn't just to make another bully character, but sort of dive into the mindset of the boss friend and the pros and cons that come from it. And a point that a lot of people on the show have made, from Brawley to her voice actress, Anna Akana, is that Sasha isn't explicitly a bad person. Her behavior up to this point has been questionable at best, and she participates in Grimes' plan to make an example to the frogs by sacrificing Hop Pop at the tower, but there's still all the complicated layers that come with it. Anne may have had time to build a proper relationship with the residents of Wartwood, but Sasha hasn't. And a lot of the relationships she's fostered at Toe Tower up to this point have been with the ulterior motive of eventually finding her friends and getting back home. Everything else is just a means to that end in her eyes. At the same time, she decides that as long as she's here, she might as well enjoy herself. And for a person who has more control freak tendencies, the chance to be a ruthless lieutenant in a merciless army is probably a dream come true. Of course, I don't say all this to excuse her behavior, far from it. I just think a lot of her worst qualities come more from apathy than outright maliciousness. She doesn't see the frogs or toads as sentient beings with their own lives, just weird, overgrown creatures. She even calls Sprig a squeaky toy when he stands up to her for Anne. Ugh, I think I've had enough of you, squeaky toy. Inspiring Anne to do the same for what might be the first time in her life. Anne! What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. Standing up to you! <gasps> the duel at Toad Tower is the culmination of a lot of repressed feelings for Anne, and Sasha's own realization that she hasn't been a very good friend. As the tower starts to crumble around them, thanks to a little demolition planting from One-Eyed Wally, Anne and the planters struggle to keep a hold of Sasha, who is about to plummet to her death. And what she says to Anne left me genuinely speechless the first time I saw it. Hey Anne, maybe you're better off without me. That is just... damn. I'm always kind of amazed at the stuff current kid shows get away with. I mean, there's always been shows aimed at younger audiences that managed to slip in some pretty mature stuff. But other times you had instances where something like the 90s Spider-Man show couldn't use any instance of the word blood, or had to call the Sinister Six the Insidious Six for god knows whatever reason. And then there's Digimon. When the clock strikes the hour of the beast, the undead king will reveal himself in his true form. Terrific, but what's the hour of the beast? Six, six, six. <laughs> On Fox Kids! They re aired it on ABC Freaking Family! <laughs> How do you get away with the number of the fing beast? In any of these shows, though, it's pretty rare to see something like Sasha letting go of Anne at Toad Tower. I mean, for all intents and purposes, Sasha had no reason to believe she would survive that fall. Grime saves her at the last minute, sure, but for a moment, I honestly didn't expect him to. And yeah, we've seen characters willingly let themselves die on kids' TV before, but I'm hard-pressed to think of a lot of examples involving children. There's so much to dissect in just the simple action of letting Anne's hand go. Matt Brawley has said in a co-interview with Dana Terrace that it's one of his favorite things to see fans try to dissect, and I can see why. As an aspiring author myself, and as someone who makes fanfics or videos online, I long for those moments in the stuff I make that get people talking, get people analyzing, opening up their third eyes to the cosmos to gather more insight, offering tribute to the great god Kos, or some say Cosm, to gather more eyes. Grant us eyes, grant us eyes, grant us eyes. The reaction from Anne is pitch perfect as well. All she can do after witnessing one of her oldest friends willingly fall to her death is sit there eyes wide and watch as Grime and the other toads leave with Sasha into the unknown. Anne, are you okay? Oh yeah, never felt... <laughs> <laughs> That's such a genuine moment that I'm so happy was in this episode. The poor girl's been through a lot, has had to process so much in such a short span of time, 
I'd be amazed if anyone in her shoes, or shoe, wouldn't have the same reaction. A portion of Season 2 focuses on the aftermath of Toad Tower from Sasha's perspective, and how she and Grime start to scheme ways to get back on top. And not just back to the top of Toad Tower either, but the top of the top. All the while, Sasha struggles between her desire to gain some form of control after she lost her own over Anne, and a genuine sense of trying to be better for others, but ultimately still putting her own desires first. But what exactly is the top of the top in Amphibia? Well, that's where Marcy comes in. Season 2 sees the Planter family on the road to the amphibian capital city, Newtopia, where they believe they might get answers on how to send Anne home. After many misadventures and shenanigans, they arrive at the city to find the gates shut and an infestation of barbarians, eh, cute, hindering their progress. It's here where we're formally introduced to the third and final friend of Anne's posse, Marcy, a whiz kid and nerd of the highest degree. Who are these cuties? <gasps> are they your surrogate frog family? Did they find you and take you in? Oh, I love the found family trope! Where season one focused a bit on the relationship between Anne and Sasha, the relationship between Anne and Marcy is showcased much more frequently, with Marcy taking a supportive role for most of season two, even getting her own focus episode with popular side character Maddie back in Wardwood. Do you ever think it's weird when the main characters aren't in an episode? Eh, you don't miss them. Anne tells Sprig that, back in their world, Marcy was very prone to clumsiness due to being wrapped up in her games or own imagination. Thus, Anne would always have to watch out for her. And while, much like her friends, Marcy has come into her own in Newtopia, even earning the favor of the king and a high command in the Newtopian army. Anyway, I just roleplayed like your typical artificer rogue and next thing I know, boom! I'm the chief ranger of the Newtopian night guard! Uh, were those words? Anne can't help but revert back to her old habits and overprotect her friend, which, ironically, is the problem Sasha had when she and Anne finally met up again, and she thought their relationship would remain stagnant, even after several weeks, if not months, apart. Marcy ends up having a similar problem of her own in that regard, but... We'll get to that later. The thing about Marcy, too, is that while she is very clumsy and prone to getting wrapped up in her own mind, she's also incredibly smart and thrives on puzzles and brain teasers, as shown when she and the planters officially arrive in Utopia, and the king sends a message to her through a scavenger puzzle. Anne can't help but feel a little inadequate in that regard compared to Marcy, saying that she's always felt kind of dumb in comparison. Of course, where Anne fails in conventional book smarts, she more than makes up for it in her own strengths. Namely, her ability to make friends with practically anybody. Something Marcy admits she finds herself jealous of. Yeah, sure, I'm good at solving puzzles and calculating the check, but you're amazing at making connections. I Me, mean, I have trouble looking people in the eyes sometimes. A lot of people picked up from this in the preceding episode that Marcy has more than a few neurodivergent traits. Something Matt Brawley said he wholeheartedly supports, even if it wasn't his or the crew's intention to specifically represent a neurodivergent person. Speaking as a neurodivergent person myself, there's actually a lot I can see in myself and Marcy. I'm nowhere near as smart, and I feel after over 20 years' experience, I'm fairly decent at maintaining eye contact. But there are definitely times where I can zone out on whatever it is I'm supposed to be doing, and focus on whatever actually interests me. My own story ideas, thoughts on certain media I like, and I find that if I don't focus enough on what I'm trying to say, I can trail off in the middle of a sentence trying to grasp for the words I was trying to... The show has really neat animation. Joking aside, Marcy represents the sort of neurodivergent coded character who is both super smart and super friendly but with a little bit of social awkwardness, which is always nice to see, especially in stuff geared towards kids. And even with that social awkwardness, she still manages to do pretty well for herself, practically becoming number two to King Andreas himself. Brief tangent, I really love this guy's design and how huge he is. He's like if Gwyn and Vendrick from the Dark Souls games had a baby with a salamander. Much like Sasha, however, Marcy has her own hangups that still linger from the human world. And, unlike Anne, she hasn't had a lot of time to grow past these issues. Issues that come to roost in some rather dark ways. While we're on that subject, can we talk about how this show is kind of flippin' dark? I remember 
remember when Amphibia was first being advertised. There was a heavy emphasis on the quirky frog world and how Anne was a fish out of water in this kooky setting. All well and good. Typical fantasy world shenanigans and hijinks and MOTHERFUCK! Behind the cute design of the characters and the higher emphasis on comedy, there's a dark underbelly to Amphibia that manages to rear its ugly head every so often through either the creature design or the threat of death very much being a recognized danger in this world. At least it'll be a quick painless death. Why would this be painless? Just let me have this lie! It goes even deeper than just perilous episodes involving cannibalistic frogs, creepy hitchhikers, or terrifying creatures like <laughs> Why does this show go so hard with the spiders? Some of the subject matter can be kinda heavy for what, at first, seems like a jovial adventure romp through Amphiboland. Trivia note, that was gonna be the show's original title. The stuff with Sasha at Toad Tower is probably the heaviest it got for season one. But season two opens up new layers to the trauma that Anne and the planters have to go through nearly every 11 minutes. One noticeable instance where the show gets pretty real is in the otherwise lighthearted episode Hopping Mall, where Anne and the planters try to find souvenirs for themselves and for Anne's mom back home. She ultimately ends up with a butterfly trinket, since her mom loves butterflies. And later that night, she reminisces on some of her mom's annoying quirks with Sprig. She'd always sing these goofy Thai love songs, and man was her singing bad. Woof, that woman was beyond tone deaf. You know, the funny thing is, right now, I would give anything just to hear her singing. It's a bit unfortunate that this episode premiered when it did in some ways. Mainly because, by mid-September of 2020, I think many of us watching could relate to the feeling of missing even the stuff we found annoying about the people we love. People we may not have seen for months due to the events of last year. Events that we're only just starting to see the end of, hopefully. If I can be real for a second, I haven't seen my own family since January of last year, and Anne's wistful melancholy is something that hit me pretty hard, even when I randomly stumbled on this clip without seeing the rest of the show. Of course, Spriggs admittance that he doesn't even remember his own mom doesn't help. You know, I've always wondered, can you miss someone you never actually knew? <laughs> That's silly. I mean, of course you can't. <laughs> it's too real, man. <laughs> I'm not even joking, I'm actually crying. <laughs> On the subject of Sprig and Polly's mom, you may have noticed throughout the series that the show doesn't really bring their parents up that much. You can probably count the instances on one hand. You could just chalk this up to Disney being Disney. No, 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 already did that joke. But it also leads into another heavy moment not much later in season two, that pulls a double whammy and ties into the overall myth arc of the music box that got Anne and her friends to this world in the first place. You see, not long after Anne introduces the box to the planters, Hop Pop soon learns that it's a dangerous artifact called the Calamity Box, and buries it in the front yard. Months later, when Anne gets word from Marcy on how they can recharge the stones in order to send them home, Hop Pop goes to dig it back up, but finds it missing. The music box! It's gone! What? Anne's faith in Hop Pop is completely shattered by this, and she leaves, content to recharge the gems with Marcy herself, even leaving Sprig and Polly out of it, until Hop Pop explains himself. Sprig and Polly's parents. It was a few years ago. I was on a journey when the herons attacked Wartwood. Sprig and Polly survived, but their parents weren't so lucky. You bastards! This is for Sprig and Polly! Oh, sweet, I beat a challenge. Even though the episode ends much as you'd expect, with Anne forgiving Hop Pop and them all having a group hug, there's still a lot of tension between them in the next episode when the time comes to recharge one of the gems. Tension that rises the longer both Anne and Hop Pop try to ignore the lingering feelings they have over the incident. I mean, what's it gonna take for you to let this go? Hop Pop, I... I... Just tell me and I'll do it! They don't know! No! Huh? You might be wondering why I'm talking about this in a section where I claim the show is pretty dark, and maybe that was poor wording on my part. It's not that the show is one of the darkest things Disney's ever put on TV. 
That comes later. Just that the tone can get pretty damn heavy. And the crew are obviously pushing every limit they can while working at Disney Channel. Calm down everyone, it's just wax. A lot of care was put into handling the realistic ramifications of a teenager lost in a fantasy world, with seemingly no easy way to get home. And while Anne is able to take it in stride and find a community and family that supports her, it's still not enough for her to feel completely at home. She misses her mom, she misses her family, and no amount of larger-than-life adventure can change that, especially for someone so young. It's kind of easy to forget in these shows the level of trauma these young characters go through, especially when they're mostly played by adults well into their 30s. No disrespect to Brenda Song, she's a queen. And trauma isn't normally discussed in kids' shows because of how naturally heavy such a topic is. However, a lot of recent kids' shows have started to address the topic in ways that are easily digestible for their target audience, and that's a great thing. Especially when a show is able to balance the darker aspects with the light. No! My I've said plenty of times before that I'm a great proponent of including more horror elements in children's media too, so I absolutely love how dark this show can get in every aspect. From the subject matter, to the lore, to even the creature design. <laughs> and there's nowhere else where all three come to its darkest apex than in... Okay, this probably stopped being funny the first couple times I did it, but I gotta talk about a few more things before I get to the season 2 finale, so... Hashtag sorry, not sorry. One of the more understated parts of Amphibia is related to the music box, or Calamity Box, which is the way cooler thing to call it, IMHL. Namely these three gems that I mentioned in passing before. Season 2 reveals that the box's teleportation powers come from the gems, and that recharging them at three specific temples around Amphibia will be able to send Anne and her friends back home. But the clues as to the gems' power and attributes were actually there from the beginning. The first really subtle thing is how, in the series intro, the gems on the box are all colored red, blue, and green. But when Anne looks at the box later on at the end of the first segment of the first episode, they're white. You might not have registered that at first, but your brain did. Except I'm pretty sure my brain didn't because I didn't even register the gem colors until I was watching a reaction vid to season one. The mystery starts to feel like maybe it's more about the jewels that just don't have color and no one's talking about it. Season 2 starts to make the connection a bit more blatant, as whenever Anne, Marcy, or Sasha experience a very intense emotion, their eyes will glow either blue, green, or red. Something that was also present in Season 1, but you really had to be observant to spot it. It's not until Anne and the planters go to Newtopia and meet with King Andreas that he explains the gem's significance and that their colors relate to three attributes. Wisdom, heart, and power. By your powers combined, I am Captain Planet! The scenes where the girl's eyes change is made even more significant then, when you realize that it pertains to each of the three attributes they exhibit the most. In Marcy's introduction episode, when she comes up with a plan to save Sprig from the Queen Barbariant, her eyes briefly flash green when it succeeds, proving her wisdomness. ness this big brain thing. Later, in an episode where Sasha is trying to help Grime find an ancient toad hammer to prove themselves worthy of leading a rebellion against Newtopia, more on that in a bit, she also hears in passing that Anne and Marcy have met up and are working together to get home without her. This gives her the pure anger and spite necessary to lift the hammer and her eyes flash red before she does, showing her relation to power. And for Anne, who as early as episode 1 couldn't let an innocent frog child get eaten by a giant mantis, who risked life and limb when she thought the planters were going to die from getting sick out in the rain while Anne faked being sick to get off doing chores, the girl who had tried to save her old friend even when she was at her absolute worst. For her, it's when the planter's farm is destroyed by her own mistake. A mistake she made trying her best to give back to the family who had put so much on the line for her. The family she had come to see as her own. Oh, you just made a big mistake, buddy. Anne is someone who has always worn her heart on her sleeve. Even when she has problems with her own stubbornness or standing up to peer pressure, she'll ultimately do the right thing and put others before her without giving it much thought. All the fine qualities of a great protagonist, 
and best shown when at the second temple to charge of the gems. She's put through a secret test of character where her constant good deeds are one thing, but taking accountability for her mistakes is what ultimately proves herself worthy. But empathy alone isn't enough for what is heart without responsibility. I feel like it's important for kids to know that being a hero, or even just a good person, doesn't mean you have to be perfect or exemplify good virtues exclusively. Anne messes up nearly every episode in some way or another. But where it counts, she'll always be there for her friends and put them first, even at the cost of her own safety, which can be an equally bad thing if you take it too far. Sasha and Marcy have their own moments too, where they realize that relying too much on wisdom or power can have their drawbacks as well. For Marcy, it's when her hyper-focus on nothing but the puzzles in the first temple made her ignorant to how Anne and Hop Pop were still struggling with their feelings towards the latter's lie about the Calamity Box. And once she realizes it, she forfeits the temple rather than let more harm come to them. And for Sasha, it's in the penultimate Battle of the Bands episode where she admits to herself that she has a problem with her sense of control. I have opinions about everything, and if I'm not in control at all times, I'll go crazy. It's actually kind of exhausting. And yeah, I know her attribute is specifically power, but what is control if not a form of power? Checkmate, atheists. <laughs> Anne is even told several times by Marcy in one episode to think with her head and not her heart, which is something Anne struggles with and contributes to a lot of her impulsiveness, and to her willingness to trust others even when they may not have her best intentions at heart. Something that rears its head again when Sasha comes back into their fold, claiming to have changed along with Grime, playing on her old friend's sense of camaraderie to use them for an audience with the king, and to lead a rebellion of toads to shake up the system once and for all. Now, the reason they want to do that is fairly simple. You see, the political system in Amphibia is mostly built upon a sort of caste system in which the working classes- Oh, there you go, bringing class into it again! That's what it's all about! It's not immediately apparent, since we're not given a proper introduction to the Greater Newt Society until the planters visit Newtopia, but there's a definite pyramid system set up in Amphibia, and frogs, especially the frogs in Wartwood and the valley surrounding it, are generally on the bottom. Later on, we're introduced to a higher social class of frog when the family travel outside the valley, but the majority of frogs in Amphibia, let's make a rough estimate and say the 99%, are mostly working class farmers, chefs, merchants, and other thankless menial jobs. On the higher tier of the pyramid, you have the Toads, who, from the vast majority we've seen on the show, mostly comprise of warriors who act as the enforcers of amphibian law, handed down from the highest authority of King Andreas, who resides safely at the very top of the pyramid, alongside the Newts of Newtopia who enjoy the most technologically advanced city and greatest assortment of food, entertainment, and other frivolities. And now to put on my hat! <laughs> Again, not every frog is poor, and not every toad wants to be a warrior. But the status quo of this world mostly falls into those categories, and any deviation from this norm is met with extreme resistance. For example, the local vagabond of Wartwood, One-Eyed Wally, is revealed to come from a well-to-do family, but prefers to live in squalor. The truth is, and I live like a bum in Wartwood because, well, it's what I love. A real Frank Reynolds of frogs, this guy. Wait, is that redundant? When he's outed by Anne for not wanting to follow the family business, the reaction from his father is anything but warm. Even though, as is revealed at the end of the episode, Wally's father has some of the same weird tendencies that his son does. But he's had to keep them hidden since it wasn't expected for a rich frog like him to enjoy... the... jug... instrument. You know, I bet there's at least one rich freak out there who has this exact secret hobby. Another example of the status quo comes from the character of Mayor Toadstool, Wartwood's resident toad who frequently embezzles the town's money for his own personal wealth even willing to let Toad tax collectors rough up his citizens to keep said wealth a secret. Toadstool is one of the bigger sources of conflict throughout the lower stakes episodes of Season 1, and this culminates in an episode where Hop Pop inadvertently becomes his political opponent for mayor, where Hop Pop runs a campaign based on actually caring about the people of Wartwood and wanting to impose legitimate reform. Toadstool is still mostly concerned with keeping power for power's sake, and again, for the money that entails. 
Even when it seems like Hop Pop is a shoe in beating Toadstool not only at the local polls, but also in the various challenges that test the brains and brawn of the potential mayors. Something I feel would make real-world election cycles much more interesting. The system is ultimately rigged in favor of Toadstool, someone with much more power, influence, and, again, money, than Hop Pop. This accidental campaign, however, sends ripples throughout the entire valley. Grimes says that there are reports of frog rebellions everywhere, all stemming from Hop Pop's ill-fated run for mayor, and from his and the rest of Wartwood's act of defiance against the Toad Tower tax collectors. Try saying that five times fast. It's the reason why Grime wanted to feed him specifically to the Venus Sarlik pit in the first place. Ironically, in a domino effect sense, Hop Pop's acts of supposed rebellion against the Toads is what inspires Grime and Sasha to rebel against King Andreas, and try to take control of Amphibia for themselves. And honestly, why not? Not to say that violent, hostile rebellions are always the answer. Though they do get results. Suck it, you dirty tea drinkers! But after serving as mere muscle for the higher class of Newts and the King, some form of political consternation was bound to happen sooner or later. And what better time for the frogs or the toads to rise up than when the outside influence of two rebellious teenage girls stoke their flames? Matt Brawley has spoken in a lot of interviews about how change is one of the major themes of Amphibia as a whole. The changes that Anne, Sasha, and Marcy all go through, the change each girl brings to the society that they end up living in, and the ripples that spread throughout the land because of it. Of course, not all change can be beneficial even if it comes from the most altruistic or genuine of places. Something everyone learns when the full extent of King Andreas' plans to change the political compass of their world are revealed. No, it's not a fake out this time, we're actually talking about true colors now. When I was writing the script for the Owl House video, I made a conscious effort to exclude one of the more major plot lines of season 1, so that anyone who hadn't seen the show could feasibly still be surprised by it. I planned to do the same as I was watching Amphibia and trying to come up with talking points, but once the season 2 finale, True Colors, finally aired, I knew that was gonna be impossible. Is it hyperbole to say that pretty much everything in this show, from the character arcs to the lore to even the political commentary was leading up to this point? Probably not. Sasha and Grime's rebellion, Sasha and the rest of the girls' character arcs, the purpose of the Calamity Box, how flipping dark this show can get. Everything comes full force in this season finale and shakes up the status quo for the rest of the show going forward, making it the most important episode thus far. So if I were to talk about why Amphibia was great and wanted to have some endpoint describing just how great it can be, I realized I had to talk about it, spoilers be damned. And does this make it the most perfect episode of the series yet? Well... I've discussed the show's pacing like 50 minutes ago, but I don't think I really got into how decently they managed to fit most of these stories in 11 minutes. As I said before, there are a few 20 plus minute episodes for the really important moments, like True Colors. But most of the time, the show retains its 11 minute structure. It's easy to look at other shows like Owl House or Gravity Falls, and think the 23 minutes, give or take, that they have per episode make for a more coherent and less rushed plot. But when you have to leave room for capitalism, every second counts no matter the runtime. And it's honestly pretty amazing how these shows manage to fit everything into a relatively short half an hour. With Amphibia, there was only a handful of episodes I can think of where I thought the shorter runtime was kind of a hindrance. The biggest one probably being the Third Temple, where they juggle Sasha and Grime's return, Anne's lingering feelings of mistrust, and Sasha redeeming herself in Anne's eyes, all in the span of a regular episode. It's not bad by any means. I don't think there's a singular bad episode of this show, to be honest. But still, it's one of the few times I felt the pacing took a serious hit. And I think True Colors, despite its longer runtime, also took this hit somewhat. We go from arriving in Utopia, to meeting the King, to Grime and Sasha enacting their rebellion, to Anne inspiring the others to fight back in pretty quick succession, not leaving a lot of time for moments to breathe and the weight of Anne's complete contempt for Sasha to sink in. Anne, I know you're upset, but just- No! I'm done listening to you! I'm done trusting you! You're a horrible person, and I am done being friends with you! 
Oh, snap. I'm not trying to knock any of the crew's efforts on this episode. It's legit their most impressive work so far. But something like this would have probably been better suited for an even longer special episode. But even then, you still want to get to the point in as snappy a way as possible, so maybe I'm just being spoiled. The point of the episode, of course, being the eventual reveal of what King Andreas has been up to. Throughout the season, we've had hints that he's not the jovial, genial guy he's presented himself as. And whatever scheme he's concocted, he's managed to rope Marcy into it somehow, who was very adamant that they returned the Calamity Box to Andreas once they charged all three gems. Well, almost all three. Oh ho 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 foreshadowing? Sasha and Grime are first to discover this scheme, once they remove a saccharine tapestry of the king and his subjects, to reveal a darker tapestry of him dominating said subjects underneath. When Sasha tries to warn Anne about this, she, of course, doesn't believe her. And Sasha can only look on in horror as her unintentionally justified coup ends. Oh no. Sasha was already struggling with herself before Anne was done with her too. Visibly unsure at the prospect of betraying her friend again at the Third Temple. And just as unsure when they were knee-deep into the coup. All her life, she's been obsessed with being the one in control. The one with all the power. Not only now is she starting to see where that's leading her. And even when she tries to make things right, her past actions have taken that chance away from her. To the eventual ruin of them all. It takes the king all of five seconds to completely flip the script and reveal himself for the power-hungry tyrant that he is. Revealing his ancestors as conquerors, and using the box to power his castle and lift it into the air. Showing us, if you will, his true colors. I regret nothing! His intentions are not the only ones revealed, however. As Marcy pleads with the king to stop this, that this wasn't part of their plan, he coldly tells the other girls that Marcy has known more about that box for much longer than she's let on. Back in the season 1 finale, you may have noticed that Marcy was suspiciously absent during Anne's birthday escapades with Sasha. It turns out, while studying in the library, she came across a mysterious book that contained a description of the Calamity Box, saying that it could transport people to other worlds. She doesn't think much of it at the time, but after she's told by her parents that they're moving out of state for her dad's job, the idea of going to other worlds with her friends seems like a fantasy she'd do anything to make reality. So when she just so happens to stumble on a box in a thrift shop that looks exactly like it, how can she pass it up? Oops, looks like I spilled the tea as you kids say. <laughs> Marcy tries to explain herself to her friends, tries to point out all the good things that have happened to them since they arrived in Amphibia. But it doesn't change the fact that, in her own desire to never be separated from them, she's caused a rift between her two friends that can never be fixed again so easily. But look at how much fun we've had! Look at how much you've both grown! Look at Sprig! I gave you this! I gave you everything! I just didn't want to be alone. Before, when Anne said that Marcy could become so wrapped up in her own head that she fails to see the bigger picture, it was subtle foreshadowing to how Marcy still considers this as just one big D&D game, or whatever the legally distinct version is in the show. Even when Marcy first meets the planters, she's speaking in terms of a fantasy story rather than reality. Oh, I love the found family trope! It's not like equating reality to fantasy is inherently wrong, but when you use it as the basis for your whole worldview, it can lead to terrible consequences. Marcy thought that her escapist fantasy would lead to fun adventures with her and her friends, like something out of an isekai anime or a fantasy game. But if there's one thing the constant threat of danger in Amphibia has proven, it's that quirky, no-consequence fantasy worlds probably couldn't exist in real life. These children have been without their parents for so long, forced into one perilous situation after the next. And sure, middle school is the worst, but I think given the alternative of death, they'd gladly sit through a few boring classes every so often. Marcy, understandable as her intentions were, didn't give Anne and Sasha this choice. She forced it on them, and now they're all in the greatest danger they've ever been. With not just the fate of Amphibia at stake, but their world as well. I'm sorry, Anne, but I'm afraid you and your friends can't go home just yet. 
wouldn't want you telling anyone about the coming invasion. What? Marcy owns up to her mistake immediately by taking arms against Andreas and his robots with the rest of the planters, Sasha and Grime. And they're all able to hold their own against him well enough. Polly even finally grows her legs. My little baby's got legs! But it's still not enough. And Andreas makes his opinion of friendship fairly clear when Anne tries to save Sprig. Before this episode aired, there was a brief content warning put in the last trailer saying, This episode has some intense final scenes. It might be scary for younger viewers. And hot damn they weren't lying. Anne completely loses her shit. And since she didn't wait to fully charge the gem at the second temple, her connection with the Calamity Box comes in full force in probably the best sequence of animation on this whole friggin' show. Give him back. Give him back! There aren't as many moments of incredibly fluid, incredibly detailed animation in this show as there were in Owl House, but they more than made up for that with this scene. The animation was handled by Small Boo Animation, a husband and wife duo who have worked on a number of TV shows from Adventure Time to Clarence. And they've even recently collaborated with indie video game company Pillow Fight for the game Later Alligator, which released on the Switch earlier this year. Of course, you can't attribute everything great about an animated sequence to just one or two people. There's a lot that goes into making these sequences so visually jaw-dropping, and everyone on the show deserves heaps of praise for what they managed to do. But hot dang, the scene where Anne goes ape shit on Andreas is some of the coolest anime shit I've ever seen in a non-anime show, and a nice little tease for what Anne might be able to do in Season 3 once she gets a better handle on these powers. Marcy is able to save Sprig while Anne is going Super Saiyan, and manages to get the box to send Anne and the planters through a portal, but not before- Now look what you've made me do. This, by far, is the darkest thing I have ever seen on the Disney Channel. And I'm sure plenty of you will happily point out other shows with even darker moments, that's fine. But to my recent memory, there's never been a Disney Channel show that showed a character, a 13-year-old character, mind you, who was stabbed, no, no, not just stabbed, impaled by the villain. That's the kind of stuff that gets vaguely implied in most kid shows. Or when it does happen, it usually happens to non-human characters. And I mean, obviously it's not the most graphic impalement ever. There's no blood or guts spilling out the tip of Andreas' sword or anything, but... I don't know, I'm... Jesus! Before the episode was set to premiere on May 1st, there was a whole kerfuffle with Disney Channel where they pulled it from the schedule not 24 hours before it aired, for seemingly no reason besides scheduling shifts. After seeing the finale when it finally dropped on the 22nd, I can kinda see why Disney was so hesitant to let it air. This is pretty heavy even for how relatively tame it is. Now, does that excuse the fact that after they initially pulled the episode, they apparently forgot to tell iTunes not to put it online a day later? No, not at all. Disney sucks. I had a plan. I still have a plan. What plan? What goddamn plan? It's probably safe to say that cable TV as we know it is going the way of the dodo in this, the streaming age. Current Disney CEO Bob Chapek has said in a recent statement that the company plans to close 100 TV channels this year alone, having already closed 30 channels last year. I am of two minds about how much focus companies have put onto streaming as a whole. On the one hand, with platforms like Netflix, Disney Plus, or HBO Max, I can see the convenience of having really popular shows and movies all in one area, especially for the platforms that exclusively focus on one company and their subsidiaries. And the original shows that these companies have made to compete with each other have been of the highest quality to even rival major motion pictures. On the other hand, what was once new and alternative to the pitfalls of cable is slowly and steadily becoming just the new cable. Though they were pretty slow on the uptake, once Netflix started to prove itself as a powerhouse, every major media conglomerate decided they needed a piece of that streaming pie. And now everything from NBC to Paramount to that absolutely atrocious failure by Jeffrey Katzenberg last year has tried to stake their claim in the streaming wars. And it's probably only a matter of time before these platforms start to come in packaged bundles, a la DirecTV or Dish or any other cable network that we were supposed to be moving past with all this streaming nonsense. 
Oversaturation of the market aside, this also leaves regular TV channels in a bit of a weird position. The core target audience of Disney Channel, kids to young adults, are spending less and less time watching traditional TV, and more time on streaming or internet-adjacent devices. This probably explains why some TV shows are released not in the week-by-week -week format, but more as events where multiple episodes are released across the span of a five-day week. This pseudo-binge format was what the entirety of Amphibia Season 1 was released under, from June 17th, 2019 to July 18th of the same year. And this honestly might be the reason this show stayed under my radar for as long as it did. The trouble with the binge format, popularized by Netflix releasing entire seasons of their shows on the same day, is that there's very little room to build anticipation and hype within a show's fanbase. Not to say that the binge format doesn't have its uses, or that some shows are more suited to said format than being released on a weekly basis. But if there's anything that shows like The Mandalorian or WandaVision on Disney Plus have proven, it's that you have way more chances for positive word of mouth with a weekly format, and much more time for the audience to get invested and try to solve the mysteries themselves, for better or worse. While Season 1 of Amphibia probably lent itself better to a pseudo-binge format than Season 2 would, it still had its drawbacks that Matt Brawley was eager to point out when Season 2 was announced. He also pointed out that binge-releasing a show makes for terribly long hiatuses, which, <laughs> preach, brother. It's easy for the uninformed to blame the show's creators for this binge-release format or the long hiatuses, but you hopefully didn't need me to tell you at this point that that's entirely not the case. An episode could be shined, shipped, and ready to go months in advance, but will ultimately be at the mercy of the network for when they eventually release. And while production on Season 2 of Amphibia was reportedly very hectic and rushed, with episodes sometimes not being fully completed until a week before they would air, it still completely boggles my mind that Disney would pull True Colors from its release date 12 hours before it was supposed to air. I'll freely admit, I still don't know much about the process of making a TV show, animated or otherwise. But I'm pretty sure the higher-ups must have known the subject matter of True Colors and how hard it goes for some time, right? Someone has to approve these scripts and the animation before it goes through, right? The channel isn't run by a bunch of monkeys stacked into one badly fitting suit, right? Again, the delay would have been one thing had the entire episode not leaked on iTunes the day after it was supposed to air. If you weren't involved in the hype surrounding True Colors up to that point, Brawley and the rest of the crew who were on Twitter were eagerly teasing their excitement for what was to come. Retweeting fan art, posting their own art, everyone was pumped. And to have that taken away so suddenly, only to have that present torn open and shoved into as many eyeballs as possible, suffice to say, nobody was pleased. Matt Brawley, the rest of the crew, and even a lot of his peers at Disney Channel and beyond were quick to call out Disney for how utterly they shit the bed, and rightfully so. Even if it wasn't the season finale and the leaked episode entailed Anne and the Planters having a lovely tea party, it would still be utter bullshit to let this happen. I honestly will never understand what was going on with the higher-up's heads. No matter how dark the episode got, this was inexcusable. This is just one of many dunderheaded things that traditional cable networks have done in the past few years, though. Especially when it comes to adamantly clinging to the dying format that is traditional TV. I mean, I might be something of a hypocrite considering I'd hate to see the traditional movie theater format die out. But it's not like you have to go out and spend dozens of dollars to see the latest TV show. That's always involved planting your sweaty butt on the couch and gluing your eyes to your humble TV screen. So why do networks and companies like Disney cling to the traditional method of releasing these shows? Can you even imagine the reach a show like Amphibia would have if they released it on Disney Plus the same day or day after it was released on the regular Disney Channel? And sure, they already kind of have that format with Disney now, but you need a subscription to Disney Channel to use it, and why get a simple subscription to the channel when you can get practically all of Disney's content for Whatever the f*** it costs, I don't know, I'm not trying to shill for Disney, screw Disney, what have they done for me? What have they done for me? What have they done? Where's my goddamn Owl House Season 1 on Canadian Disney Plus, you ass f***s? You said it was coming October 30th, but you didn't specify that that was USA exclusive. Seriously, Disney, what the f***? <laughs> 
Regardless of the intent behind the decision to delay True Colors, or the focus the company intends to take on phasing out Disney Channel over time in favor of their streaming platforms, Matt Brawley and the entire Amphibia team were done incredibly dirty by this seemingly random move on Disney's part, and they all deserved way better. But to keep their heads held high, and to encourage fans to wait for the episode to officially release, even when no official announcement was in sight for weeks, you gotta admire it. And if you skipped the True Color section of this video because you haven't caught up with the show yet, I'm gonna get right to the point and say, please go watch this show. If anything I've said up to this point sounds even the slightest bit up your alley, you'll love what they do with True Colors, even if I have my own little nitpicks about it. Amphibia is a show that is centered around change, good and bad, and this crew has dedicated so much time to making it the best it can possibly be, and they deserve the world for it. I hope they get it and 50 times more when season 3 finally comes, and I hope, if nothing else, that this video might spark some more interest from those who are either on the fence or have never heard about it before. Will it be to everyone's taste? Probably not. I mean, nothing is. But you'll never know until you take that leap, or hop, of faith. What, was I too early? Oh, there's still like 15 minutes left? Who am I talking to? I'm the only person making this. Since I covered a lot of smaller topics that couldn't fit into their own dedicated sections in the Owl House video, I figured I'd do the same for Amphibia. I'll be jumping around topics a lot, so for all of you people who are just listening to this video while you do other stuff, no judgment, I'll use this sound effect for when I change topics. Right, let's go. It always kinda sucks from a critical perspective when there's a bunch of characters on a show like this. Not for any negative reasons, but just because you kind of have to pick and choose who you want to talk about when you're praising the voice cast. There are so many talented professional voice actors on this show, new and old. The entire Planter family deserve their props, of course, with Justin Felbinger giving Spriggs such an energetic earnestness and a lot of memorable one-liners that always left me in hysterics. Oh, and this. Oh, I love this. This is amazing. Amanda Layton as Polly started out with a sort of cutesy nasal voice that got steadily less nasal as the show went on, but retained a lot of the innocence mixed with a crave for violence that defines much of Polly's character. So you dragged us to this horror show for no reason? Twist it, I love it. I don't remember how or when I found out, but I was pleasantly surprised when I saw that Bill Farmer, best known as the voice of Goofy since the late 80s, was voicing Hop Pop. Honestly, if you didn't know before, you probably couldn't even tell it was the same guy who did Goofy, since he gives old Hapadaya completely different inflections and a curmudgeon with a heart of gold personality to boot. <laughs> yeah, I guess we're even. Hop Hop, we broke a model ship. You crossed all kinds of ethical and moral lines. Like I said, even. All of these actors give their characters such fantastic personalities coupled with character animation that makes these frogs feel more like people than they have any right to be. You calling me a Vivica? Maybe? Our three human leads are incredible too. Anna Akana has stated in an interview with Brawley that much of Sasha's voice was her own natural inflection, which fit the bossy, manipulative nature of Sasha like a glove. But she adds a lot of natural introspection to her too. Sasha may not be one to admit her feelings willingly, but you can tell from the delivery Akana gives in certain lines that Sasha is much more conflicted than she presents herself as. And that only helps sell the complexity of her character. Hey Margo! Leave her alone. Also, nice guitar solo vents. Yeah. Haley Chu is the youngest of the three actors voicing the girls, and that probably adds a flair of authenticity to her role in the original trio. Someone that Anne looks after. Someone who, presumably, goes along with whatever Sasha wants. Just so long as they can all hang out together. She gives Marcy a sweet but confident performance, endearing you to her character pretty much from the moment you meet her. I'm a dragonfly! And I'm the personification of metamorphosis! And, of course, there's Brenda Song's return to Disney Channel as Anne. I was growing up while shows like Phil of the Future or The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody were airing, and to say that song was anything but iconic to my entire generation would be an understatement. 
Are you familiar with the gear shift? You mean the Prindle? <laughs> she has plenty of chances to show her comedic chops as Anne, but she also excels at the emotional scenes too, bringing me to tears every time I look at the scene where she misses her mom, or when she finds out that Hop Pop lied to her about the box. All I can say is it's great to have her back. You know, there was a time I'd pick out the bug bits. That time is past! And again, there's a crap ton of other voice actors I'd love to give props to, but there's just so many characters. And most of them are played by voice acting legends like Mona Marshall, April Winchell, John DiMaggio, Steven Root, Jack McBrayer, Dee Bradley Baker, Keith David. Heck, even Troy Baker is involved in this show. Now there's a chameleon of a voice actor for you. Wait, does that joke work? Are chameleons amphibians? No. They are not. Oh my goodness! goodness. Bloody car. And welcome to Stumpy's, Wirtwood's first frog Thai fusion restaurant. One of the earliest trailers I saw for Amphibia involved Matt Brawley and Brenda Song discussing the episode Lily Pad Thai, where Anne helps spruce up local restaurant Stumpy's by introducing Thai cuisine. The show takes a lot of opportunities to bring up Anne's culture in ways that feel incredibly genuine. Most likely due to the fact that a lot of her experiences were based on Brawley's as a Thai American child, and that Brenda Song is half Thai herself. I obviously can't speak to the accuracy of this representation since I'm as white as a loaf of Wonder Bread, but Brawley has stated that he wanted to showcase his heritage to people like me who may not have had much exposure to it before. There are those who point to episodes like this or the fact that Anne is Thai and call it pandering, but like, Pandering to who? Where are all these other shows coming out with Thai main characters? I'd certainly love to see them. Joking aside, I think it's especially important to introduce kids to other cultures at a young age, and to represent these cultures in the best way possible. I mean, when I was a kid, you'd still get Asian representation that looked like this. Battery 795! Here, fortune cookie! Ooh. In the interview I keep mentioning with Matt Brawley and Dana Terrace, Brawley made a pretty potent statement about the representation in Amphibia and the Owl House as a whole. The, the real like win is just existing, which is like such a funny accomplishment where it's like, you know, that it's, it's a win that Anne is Thai and that she exists. And it's like, wow, that's all you had to do is exist. And that shows you like kind of how dire it is in terms of representation. Like you take Blues who is bi and it's like, Lose's big win is existing, you know what I mean? Which is crazy, but it's like that's sort of where we are. I may not be able to speak on the accuracy of the representation, but I can say as a white, cis, mostly straight male, that I'm good if one or two shows don't feature a white, cis, heterosexual, neurotypical character. I'll be fine. Honest. I'll get by somehow. Pretty early into the planter's road trip to Notopia, they stumble on one of these Breath of the Wild looking labs, where they accidentally end up making a robot frog that follows them throughout the rest of the season. Eventually, it catches up to them when they get back to Wartwood, and Polly soon becomes fast friends with it, naming it Frobo. I really don't have much to say about Frobo as a whole, except that he's cute and pure and a good boy. <laughs> Whoa, your laugh is horrifying. I love it! I mentioned that the show can go pretty hard with a creepy creature design, but the regular cast of characters are all great too, ranging from the menacing and cool like Grime. I really love how his good eye glows, by the way. It's kind of like Nicodemus or the Great Owl from The Secret of Nim. To the super cute and small like Sprig's friend and eventual love interest Ivy, who looks like something worthy kids would create, and I mean that in the best possible way. Which leads into... The first time we meet Ivy is in an episode where Hop Pop and Ivy's mom try to force the two into a marriage for pretty selfish reasons. Even though the two like each other, they tell their parents straight up that they don't think about each other that way, and can find love for themselves, which is a pretty good message for kids. You can totally be friends with the opposite gender, and have no desire for anything beyond that friendship. Which for Sprig doesn't entirely last by the time the episode ends. Oh, you just fell in love with her, didn't you? Yeah, I just fell in love with her. I've spoken elsewhere about my own romantic history, so I won't get too into it. But I've had a similar experience where I was perfectly content to hang out with a really cool girl and consider her my best friend. 
But then I caught... Feelings. That sort of muddied the issue. Sprig is encouraged and sometimes forced by Anne to tell Ivy how he feels, but he ultimately can't bring himself to for fear how it might ruin things between them. And right when Sprig and Anne finally make peace that he probably won't be able to tell her for a long time... Hey, Sprig! There's something I've uh, been meaning to ask you. I, uh, do you, um, <clears throat> do you think you'd want to go out with me sometime? <gasps> Why does everything remind me of how much I love my wife? Hey, Becca! What? I love you! Good! <laughs> I know I went off on Mayor Toad's duel and how sketchy he was back in the politics section, but it'd be disingenuous of me to not bring up his own character growth between seasons one and two. After Toad Tower explodes and he actually stuck his figurative neck out to save a lot of townspeople, they start to take a liking to him. A liking he slowly reciprocates. When an official from Newtopia names him the best candidate for new head of Toe Tower, he's actually very reluctant to accept. Having grown to like the town and come into his own as a legitimate, non-embezzling mayor. I realize that expecting any politician to actually grow a heart or conscience is probably too unrealistic, but whatever, it's a show for kids, it can't all be dreary realism. Each of the temples the gang explores in order to recharge the gems of the Calamity Box are really cool. Like the writers were challenging themselves to come up with the coolest temple ideas for a Legend of Zelda game. I especially love the aesthetic of the first temple, or the tests of character in the second. And the third temple text being made up of the most stereotypical manly dialogue is super funny. Lift to enter, bra? The challenges in the first temple are probably my favorite though. Something I could imagine being in an actual Zelda game. The game of Flipboard at the end is also pretty neat. It's kind of like the chess scene from Harry Potter, but the biggest difference is it wasn't written by a turf. I was in a school play once, and this place is bringing back memories. I'm a tooth, that's a truth. This show is f***ing hysterical. I mean, if you thought the Owl House was funny, I personally think Amphibia is even funnier. There's so many great facial expressions, catchphrases, hoopa da boopa, <laughs> and one-liners that leave me in stitches every time I hear them. Because of me, you three almost exploded. Wait, what? I know comedy is subjective, but if you don't find yourself giggling at even the silly teen humor, then you have no soul and we can't be friends. Come on, Joe. Joe? <gasps> Joe Sparrow! Grump at the Frog here, and welcome to the official Riveton Family Challenge! Okay, I already know I had a big Disney sucks section, but I feel I need to say it here. I am a hundred times more upset over Disney's treatment of the Muppets than anything they've done with Star Wars. I freaking love the Muppets, I always have. And Disney's blatant, we don't know what the heck to do with this property approach to them has always bugged me. So even minuscule appearances of the characters, like when Kermit was a consultant to the staff in order to give better frog representation, tickled the heck out of me. This was only made better when Kermit himself was a guest star in season two as Crumpet, where they captured all of his mannerisms perfectly. And yes, I know it's Matt Vogel voicing him. Do you have no childhood wonder left in you? Apparently Fozzie had a guest spot on Big City Greens back in 2019, so I really freaking hope this means we'll get a Muppet cameo in Owl House Season 2. My money would be on Gonzo or Miss Piggy. Please, please, please let this happen. Alright, this video is running kinda long, but I'd be remiss to not mention one more thing. Is it weird that Gravity Falls is already nostalgic? I was 18 when that show came out, what the hell? Ten years old. Anyway, early in Season 2, one of the roadstop attractions the planters find themselves at is the Curiosity Hut, run by a frog who only calls himself the Curator, though he does have a proper name. Do -do -do -do. Say, Mr. Pons, do you ever get the feeling that we exist simultaneously in multiple parallel universes, completely unaware of the other's very existence? You've been licking yourself again, Frog Zeus! <laughs> Caught me again, Mr. Pons. <laughs> Everything about this episode is just one big tribute to Gravity Falls. The show that Matt Burley got his start at Disney Channel with, and the show that practically helped revive the channel in the eyes of a lot of people, including me. As such, there's not a whole lot to it if you've never seen Gravity Falls.
what the hell is wrong with you? But even then, it's still pretty amusing, with the signature dark humor that Amphibia and Gravity Falls excels at. Well, the important thing is we're all okay. Except for that curator, he's dead. Okay, I think that's enough. When The Owl House first premiered, and especially once the show really hit its stride, there were a lot of people eager to talk about it, the good and the bad. But there's still not as much buzz around Amphibia. Maybe that'll change with the end of Season 2 and the promise of new, exciting horizons in Season 3. And not every show needs an hour plus long video talking about it. <coughs> but I feel like I kinda owed it to Amphibia to give it the same treatment I did The Owl House, because of how long I slept on it, and how rewarding it was for me when I finally started watching it. There's so much creativity, passion, and heart poured into this show from everyone involved, and it deserves just as much recognition as The Owl House for the themes, characters, and craft that went into it. It's not a competition, of course, but I feel like if you were a huge fan of one show, you'll definitely enjoy the other. And if you weren't a big fan of Owl House, maybe there's something in Amphibia that will do it better for you. Obviously, I can't predict or control what people like or dislike. Neither am I the arbiter on what makes a kid's show appealing to more than just kids. I'm just a guy with way too much time on his hands, who wants to pay it forward to the cast and crew of Amphibia for keeping me entertained as I slowly lose my mind in this hellscape we call life. Speaking of hell, did you know there's apparently a frog devil? Speak of the frog devil! And rather than god, they say variations of frog? Oh my frog, Bessie! So like, is there a legit frog god in this world? A froggy heaven? Froggy hell? Froggy Purgatory? Frogatory. Yeah, I kinda already had a good conclusion at the end of the Disney Sucks segment, so if you were expecting something a little more poignant than wondering about frog theology... Not today, Chief! Phew, haven't done a long one like this in a while. And I didn't even get into my own theories about how there might be some weird doppelganger thing going on between the human world and Amphibia. Anyway, kinda like what I did at the end of the Owl House vid, I wanted to pop in real quick and drop some recommendations while we wait for the third and final season of Amphibia. The first of which is... Well, the Owl House. Season 2. It's finally coming. Or has already started given how long it takes me to make these videos. And if you somehow found this video without seeing anything related to Owl House, like I said before, if you liked Amphibia, then its sister show might be up your alley too, especially since this season promises to show some darker tones and stories that Dana Terrace wanted more of in Season 1. So check out Season 1 if you haven't already. I'd say it's on Disney+, Plus, but I don't want to make any promises this time. If you so happen to be a fellow adult who watches cartoons primarily made for children, I can actually recommend some adult animation too. Here on YouTube, I've really been enjoying Hell of a Boss by Vivzy Pop and most of the same crew who made the pilot for Hasbun Hotel. YouTube is chock full of great indie animation like this, and since the site actively tries to suppress animation that isn't specifically for kids, these projects need all the help they can get from just simply watching them and passing them around. On Netflix, there's also shows like Love, Death, and Robots or the Castlevania series that dropped seasons in the past month, and I really enjoyed both of them. I meant to make a longer video about my thoughts on them, but then my old computer crapped the bed and, well, all my motivation died with it. Say Levy. What's not on Netflix though, because they suck too, is actually the second season of Tuca and Birdie. The show used to be on Netflix, and the first season still is for now, but Netflix cancelled it after its first season for... <clears throat> reasons. Which was an incredibly stupid move because this show is amazing. The animation is lively, the characters are great, and it's super funny. If you liked BoJack Horseman, this show is even crazier. Please go check it out. And catch the second season on Adult Swim when it airs, I think the same day as Owl House Season 2 starts. Which, by this point, is probably in the past because, well, you know. Apart from that, there's a few new shows airing on channels like Cartoon Network or even Disney Channel that all look interesting, so they might be worth checking out too. And if all else fails, there's always Infinity Train on HBO Max, which definitely, definitely needs more seasons. 
So if you can boost its streaming numbers or whatever you call it, and show that we want a complete Trauma Train saga, that'd be great. All right, with all that said and done, I'm gonna go rest my voice. I think there's a frog in my throat. Heh, heh, heh. See ya.